Welcome everyone to this Tamer Center book talk online in our virtual, virtual um, series for the summer. We're excited to welcome two terrific speakers and two people I've known for now a couple of decades. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Professor Ran Kavets um, is someone actually I had as a student when I was at Columbia Business School, terrific marketing speaker and accomplished scholar. Um, I still remember our high-tech marketing and entrepreneurship classes, so really thrilled um, that he's able to join us today to introduce our speaker and Ron Gonan, both an alum of Columbia Business School, an accomplished um, social entrepreneur in his own right, Deputy Commissioner of Sanitation, long bio, but now running um, something called the Closed Loop Partners, really trying to transform how we think about waste and sustainability and circular economies. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Ran Kivitz and welcome everyone again for joining us this evening. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure um, to be here. Thank you, Sandra, um, for the introduction and, and the invitation and thanks for the Tamar Center and also for Diana. And of course, a, a tremendous thank you to Ran Gunan, um, our distinguished uh, um, guest and speaker today and, and author. We're going to discuss uh, his book. Um, let me try and get it across. The, uh, the Waste-Free World. Um, just, just his new book, book just came out. Um, and we, we actually wanted to do this as an interview format. Um, and so I will um, soon fade into the, into the background and we'll, we'll let uh, Ron do most of the, of the talking. Um, I would just say on a, on a personal note that this is um, an unbelievably gratifying, satisfying, just, just ha happiness inducing event for me. Um, having known Ron now, um, soon it's going to be 20 years. Uh, and uh, since he was a student at uh, an executive MBA at Columbia Business School, and um, by way of disclosure, we have become um, very close friends over the years. And so it's just an unbelievable. Um, a little pleasure and privilege for me to be here with Ron um, today uh, on this um, book event uh, from Columbia Business School and the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. Um, we wanna discuss a few things, uh, but we'll start, um, we do wanna start with Ron's uh, amazing career and, and background. And so um, I'll, I'll just mention that, um, um, as the book says, um, uh, in a couple of places, Ron grew up in a, in a neighborhood in Philly that was not, that was economically disadvantaged. Um, and against that backdrop or, or odds, um, he earned a, a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, then went on to work in consulting in Deloitte, um, then went to Columbia Business School. And this is the early 2000s um, when our graduates uh, mostly went into investment banking. You know, this is pre-2008, pre uh, the Great Recession. Most of our students would go into investment banking, hedge funds, um, consulting firms. And Ron did what at the time was quite um, unheard of uh, in many ways, and, and that is not going to one of those established careers or marketing, or but rather start his own company. He co-founded Recycle Bank, was the CEO of that company. Um, in fact, Columbia University, Columbia Business School was one of the early seed funders, uh, got a great return on, on its investment. Um, then went on after Recycle Bank to be the deputy commissioner for, um, for sanitation and recycling and sustainability in the Bloomberg administration was recruited by Mayor Bloomberg um, as a deputy uh, commissioner. Um, and after that had started um, uh, funds that invest in, in basically the circular economy, um, closed loop, um, the closed loop fund, which uh, has assets under management of over a quarter billion dollars. And so um, when I think of Iran, I don't think of a rowboat, or somebody rowing in the sea. Really what I, I my, my imagination, my metaphor for you, I, I think of a sailboat, a great, large, huge sailboat with great, beautiful sails, but you're sailing like that. Not, you have a clear goal. I know what it is, I respect it. It's all about the circular economy. Um, and you've, you've had that for many years, but it's more like a sailboat, changing paths and, and getting to, your, to, your, um, to where you need to get. 
can you describe to us a little bit that that path, that that um, um, tour over the seas, journey over the seas that you took? Sure. Well, uh, first, it's great to be here. Um, yesterday, I ended up uh, losing my voice, and uh, so hopefully, people will bear with me uh, through our conversation tonight. But uh, it's an honor to be here. <clears throat> I've never heard that analogy before, Ron, of um, my path being a uh, sailboat uh, going uh, in between obstacles. But I think that that's actually a uh, accurate analogy. And I think that that's an accurate analogy because I've always been very specific on <clears throat> the goal I'm trying to achieve and the direction that I want to pursue. But that direction meant disrupting entrenched interests. And so there are always uh, big medium and small obstacles that were in my way. And I had to figure out how to get around and through those uh, obstacles to get to where I was going. And that means that I've ended up taking a unique path through my career, which uh, started in management consulting, which even though in my DNA, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an inventor, I'm a disruptor, being in management consulting, starting off at uh, what was at the time Anderson Consulting, now Accenture, and then going on to Deloitte was an incredibly important foundation to my career and something that I would encourage everybody who aspires to be an entrepreneur to consider because it gave me the foundation of how business process works, how software is developed, how new business processes are implemented. And that foundation ended up being incredibly important for me. But in my late 20s, I realized that I had gained a basic knowledge of what I thought I needed to go and pursue my interests in terms of disrupting entrenched interests and trying to build business models that demonstrated that if you focus on doing business the right way, that means taking into account the environment that you're operating in, the people that are working at your company and employing proper governance, that that's how you were gonna maximize returns. And that was an idea I had in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so from management consulting, I went back to business school so that I could have the opportunity to apply that towards a business that I would build. <clears throat> and what's interesting is when I arrived at Columbia Business School in 2002, and people would say, well, when you graduate from Columbia, what are you going to do? Are you going into banking? Are you going into management consulting? What is it that you're going to do? And I would say, well, my focus is going to be building a business at the intersection between maximizing sustainable business practices and returns. The room would oftentimes literally go silent and people would kind of nod their heads, not sure if they wanted to associate with me. Some people felt bad for me, but the prevailing viewpoint was how are you going to pay back your school loans if that's what you're planning to do with your Columbia MBA? So if we think about where the sustainability space is today and the amazing growth and accomplishments that Columbia Business School has had in the space today, you can see how far we've come from that being the prevailing opinion back in 2002. I think Sandra and I were in one of the first sustainability classes together at Columbia Business School, which I think maybe had a total of seven students uh, in it. But while at Columbia Business School, I started my first company, which is a company called Recycle Bank, which was a company that developed a technology that could actually measure the amount that your home recycled and give you financial value back for that amount. And we ended up having about 50 municipal contracts. We serviced Philadelphia, we serviced uh, the city of Phoenix, the Wall Street Journal named us the number one venture backed clean tech company uh, in the world. And that was an amazing experience. I had some really significant highs. I had some really significant uh, lows, but for a uh, entrepreneur in their late twenties into their mid thirties, it was an invaluable uh, experience for me. And uh, I ended up exiting in 2010 I was very proud that the $100,000 that Columbia invested in the business, they were my first investor, turned into an exit of one and a half million dollars. So I was very proud of that. 
Uh, and uh, after I exited the business, I needed to start thinking about what was I going to do next. And I was in the unique position of being somebody who really grew up with no money. I, I've been working since I was 13, 14 years old. I did everything from be a babysitter to a nanny to being a caddy to doing construction work. And I uh, had to pay my way through all the different types of uh, education that I was able to get. And then I found myself in my early to mid thirties with, with a modest exit of being in a financial position where I had the good fortune of now being able to think about you know, what, what do I wanna do next, next in life? Um, at the same time, I was also struggling with how do I find that same passion, that same excitement that I had in building my, my business? And so I ended up doing a few different things at that time. I had a fellowship with the Aspen Institute I started teaching at Columbia Business School, which was a great opportunity, lasted um, another decade until I started having uh, kids and needed to be home every, every evening. Um, and I started my own uh, solar uh, business. And then uh, fast forward a couple of years to 2012, and uh, I got invited to join the Bloomberg administration in a new role called uh, Deputy Commissioner for Sanitation, Recycling and Sustainability which was effectively uh, a role charter to reimagine and rebuild the city sanitation department from one that was focused on sending everything to landfill to one that would be focused on uh, sustainable business practices and reduce the city's landfill disposal budget, which at the time was nearing 400 million. And so I got the chance to do that for three years, which was an amazing experience to work for the city that uh, I live in and love and has given me so much, and also be in the Bloomberg administration, which was a very, very unique uh, opportunity. And uh, as the administration was coming to an end, I came out with the concept of closed loop partners, which is the investment firm I uh, run today. And so each step that I've had in my career has fortunately enabled me to take that next step function up in my career. I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, each one of those experiences uh, has given me a skill set that has enabled me to be successful at that next level. Um, thanks so much for, for sharing that. Um, and, and you can see why I use the, the sailboat um, metaphor because moving from being a consultant and graduating with an MBA to being an entrepreneur and then going and working for the city government and so on, those are, um, I, I, I obviously agree that got you to work where you wanted to get, but um, it, 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 it took a lot of faith, I think, in, in yourself. I mean, I'm not sure if the audience uh, realizes that, you know, at Columbia now we have, in, in the Columbia University in, in general, and in Columbia Business School in particular, tremendous uh, interests and successes in entrepreneurship, in launching new uh, businesses. We have a great entrepreneurship center for, at, at Columbia Business School and the university. Also, tremendous interest in sustainability and recycling and earth sciences and so on and so forth. But in 2002, it was not like this. It was a different world. And I remember when you first spoke with me about it um, sometime around 2002, I, I said, what? I mean, we did not have sustainability and recycling and circular economy and ESG, which now, um, again, the school and the university is really at the forefront, uh, environmental and sustainability um, governance. It wasn't something that existed. My question to you though is, how did you find the, I think it's the courage is the right word or the faith to do it because those waters to stretch that uh, metaphor just one last time, those waters are, are, you know, there's storms, there's sharks swimming around you. There's uh, dolphins that are masquerading as sharks. There's all sorts of stuff. And I know you went up against some sometimes tough, tough situations. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you uh, just two quick funny stories about that. So first is a story about uh, you, which is uh, while I was at Columbia, there's a, another student named Sue Igo who joined me at Recycle Bank. And she said, there's this professor, Ron Kivitz, who works in behavioral economics. You're developing this company that can uh, record the amount people recycle and reward them for that and change behavior. You should talk to, about, to Ron about advising you. And so I remember going to talk to you and you saying, hey, this is a really interesting business model, but I consult and advise to CEOs and major corporations. Um, I'd love to help you, but I don't think you'd be able to afford 
um, my services and, and, and what I do. And I'm really busy with all of these um, CEOs and, and large corporates that I, I advise. And I, I think my response was, okay, so that's, that's really interesting. So let, let's talk about when you want to start. I think that was my, my response. And that was really the, the beginning of our, of our friendship. Uh, but, you know, I, I think one thing that uh, entrepreneurs need to have as a skill set is no is simply the beginning of the conversation. It's simply the beginning. Um, and if someone says no to you, uh, that's just an opportunity to begin a conversation as to why they said no. So you can figure out how to get them to yes. Uh, another uh, funny story I'll tell you is um, one of our first corporate partners uh, at Recycle Bank was a major supermarket chain. And um, I had been trying to get a hold of the CEO, trying to get a hold of the CEO. And uh, finally, the, the CEO uh, gave me a call. And um, I, I said, oh, you know, I've been trying to reach you for a while. Uh, what made you give me a call uh, now? And he said, um, you, um, I think, slipped something under my door recently about your company after trying to get a hold of me on the phone. And I said, yes, I did. And he said, well, let me ask you something. There's security in our building and I have an assistant that sits outside my office. So really why I'm calling you is because I thought to myself, I, I gotta figure out who this guy is that just won't take no for an answer and figured out how to get past our building security, my EA, get something under my door that I would uh, see it. And so that's just another funny story about just the initiative that uh, you need and not taking no for an answer. Um, where does it come from? To answer your specific question, um, I, I wish I had a uh, very specific answer to that question because as an entrepreneur, what I would do is bottle that up and turn that into a business that I could sell to people who want to be entrepreneurs. Um, the reality is more nuanced. I think it it's partially in my DNA to always question why are things this way? Um, I studied history as an undergrad that helped open up my mind that the way things are today aren't always the way they've been. And so you end up seeing the world through a different lens where people say, ah, this is how it's always been. You go, no, actually, that's not how it's always been. Maybe I need to start questioning more. So part of it, I think, is in my DNA. Um, part of it is I had a, a mom who kind of gave me a lot of confidence and told me I could kind of be anything I wanted to, to be. I think part of it was just the way, I, the circumstances I grew up in a kind of a very tough family environment and, and, and neighborhood where I just kind of had to fend for myself from an early age and just always assumed that I just, I'd have to just figure it out and I always wanted to be you know, the master of my own destiny. So I think it's a combination of, of things that, um, that, that make that up. And I think in, any other entrepreneurs that have had some level of success would probably kind of give you a, a, similar, a similar story. It's an amazing, um, amazing story, amazing um, um, you know, um, explanation uh, uh, for an entrepreneur. You know, don't take, you know, no, no is the beginning. Uh, you can take no as an answer, but it's the beginning of the conversation. And and one thing I've seen in, in you um, is this uh, really this yin and yang combination. I'll, I'll talk for a couple of minutes to let your throat to recover. Uh, is this yin and yang combination where, on the one hand, this tenacity, this single minded, single minded, um, single minded focus on what you think, where you want to go, and what you think is the right thing. For example, sustainability and. and and recycling and, and um, environmental issues and so on, but at the same time, a real vision and a real ability actually to, to change and be flexible as it relates to business models, for example. And I think that's a great, uh, great uh, prescription for, for um, entrepreneurship and, and business leaders, uh, certainly of younger um, companies. Um, folks that are um, tuning in uh, to uh, listen to us, thank you so much for joining. Um, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat, uh, and we will try and take uh, questions for, uh, from time to time. But we are going to devote the last 20 minutes uh, um, of, of our conversation, sometime between 6.40 and 7, the last 20 minutes, for just free flow Q&A. 
uh, between the audience and, and Ron Gunan. Uh, but if you have questions in the meanwhile, you can just type them in, and I will try to um, um, sprinkle in some of the some of the uh, questions. Um, again, um, always great to have you on. Uh, you've been a guest in my courses. You've taught at Columbia. But uh, the reason today is this new book by Ron Gunan. I'm trying to show it here on the Zoom um, as much as you can see. Um, and the book is titled uh, "How the Circular Economy Will Take Less." Make more and save the planet. Uh, the waste-free world. A new book uh, by Ron Gunen. Um, it's it's a thought-provoking book, and I've been reading it. And it's taken me more time because I would stop every few pages um, and and think and, and jot down notes and see connections to my own um, research and and frankly see connections to uh, philosophy and other stuff. Um, that if we have time, we can, can discuss. But let me ask you first, from a 30,000 feet level, um, what is your uh, overall framework um, or, or prescription, if you will, um, based on, on this notion of a circular economy and the ideas, um, the thought-provoking ideas in your book? And, and you share a lot of great examples and great stories and, and companies that you've invested and started and so on. What is your framework? Um, or, or prescription um, for society, for business, for, for the economy um, at a high level? We'll delve into specifics in a couple of minutes. Sure, at, at, a, at a high level, uh, the proposition I put forth is that for the past 75 years, we've had an economy that uh, has been functioning in a way that's not in the best interest of citizen or taxpayer. It's really been jiggered to be in the uh, best financial interest of certain entrenched industries that were politically uh, connected. And we have an opportunity now to uh, change that. And a lot of that change comes from shifting from a linear economy, which is an economy that's based on manufacturing goods through a reliance on extractive niche resources. So oil for plastic or for metals, virgin timber for uh, paper products to one that's uh, a circular economy where we're able to uh, manufacture using uh, recycled materials or through material science, new types of materials. And we can invest in product design that designs products more efficiently to cut out uh, waste. And in doing so, we avoid a dependence on natural resource extraction, avoid a dependence on uh, disposal on landfill or sometimes it leaking into our uh, oceans. And that type of economy is one that uh, operates in the best interest of citizen and, and taxpayer. Uh, and so from a, a book standpoint, to make it a fun read, uh, I go into the, the history of the development of the uh, linear economy and some of the shady actors and um, shady business that went on to build it and create the appearance that uh, what we were living under was actually was capitalism when in fact we weren't living under a capitalist system at all. We were actually living under a system that was jiggered for the best financial interest of certain entrenched industries. You talk in the book, uh, one of the things that really struck me um, um, was, in my mind, very, very strong point. You said we need to move from an acquisition to a, a subscription type of, of uh, model. And um, in, instead of acquiring products and then throwing them away and wasting them, uh, take, make, waste, we need to um, move to something that I, I would call even, even a rental model where the company itself then takes back uh, the product and really sells you a service or a subscription for a service. Um, to me, that sounded um, um, not only coherent and consistent with your, with your framework and your theory and your examples, but also that it, it has uh, the ability to give rise to a host of new business models, new companies, new innovations, um, really new ways of, of doing things. And you, met, you make this analogy with software and the digital kind of software and service and so on. Can you expand on that a little bit and where you see some opportunities there and how you see the economy and business changing in that regard? 
Um, sure. And there's some industries that are already practicing that and um, doing extremely well with those models. The first example I'd give you is uh, the car lease industry. So it used to be uh, you bought a car, you used it for X number of years, and then you sold it or went to the junkyard and then you went looking for another car. And the company that sold you that original car never really kept a relationship with you. They had to guesstimate whenever you got rid of your car and hope to capture you to get you back in for another car. The auto industry um, started moving towards uh, a lease model where now you can go and say, I want this car for a year. I want this car for three years. I want this car for five years. And really you're paying a monthly fee to the automotive company for the use of that car. And when you want a different car, um, you just take it back and they give you the model that you want and you keep paying your monthly fee. And that's a much more efficient way to run your business where you have continued cash flow for the entire life of the customer and don't have to worry about continuing to, continually trying to recapture that customer or continually trying to manufacture new cars that you're not really sure what the market demand is for. So that's an example of a lease model and circular model that's been around for a number of years. It's been very successful. And my proposition is that a number of other industries should look to adopt uh, a similar model where they uh, uh, continue to own the customer relationship after they've sold the product by telling the customer, whenever you're done using my product, let me know, bring it back to me. I'll figure out who I could resell it to or release it to or use the what I can use the parts for and I'll sell you another product. And that's in the best interest of that particular industry. You're gonna significantly increase margins and it's in the interest of the consumer. It's not in the interest of the extractive industries or the disposal industry, because now you're cutting them out of a large part of that equation and relationship. I, I gotta say that, um, th thanks for that, um, that, that answer and, and detail. Um, you know, we've done some research in behavioral economics, we'll get to it uh, later for a couple of minutes. And we found, for example, that people are much more likely to rent a product than they are to buy it, to acquire it, even, even if the price is the same. Uh, people you know, don't like to waste, actually, despite uh, the waste that is going on. And sometimes when they buy something, they feel, well, you know, I won't always need it. So why buy it? It's a waste. And am I making good use of my money? Whereas renting um, gives you a feeling that, hey, you know, I'm renting, I'm using it, and I don't need to use it forever. So I think even in terms of purchase likelihood, it could help the companies, uh, the subscription model, according to what you're saying, could, could actually drive, drive business. Well, one thing I talk about in the book is, the concept of waste in manufacturing or in our lives is a very, very, very new concept in human history. If you go back in historical texts, I don't care what culture it is, you're not gonna find much written about waste in manufacturing or waste in lifestyle. Uh, people were very cognizant of maximizing the materials that they were using and consumers and households were very cognizant of the economic power of not wasting anything. Unfortunately, post-World War II, as the extractive industries were looking to maintain their, their influence and power uh, that they had gained during World War II in terms of extracting the natural resources required for uh, the war, we began to be marketed that the highest form of status for a household was to have just as much stuff as possible. Um, and we really got suckered into that notion because number one, it's not natural. It's not how human beings have lived for centuries. Number two, it's not in our best financial interest to live that way. Um, th there's a question, uh, um, thanks Ron, fr from um, one of the audience members. And why don't I, I take it from Sally Ho. Uh, thank you, Sally, for the question. Um, um, I guess I, I will read it out loud. Um, um, question from Sally Ho. Um, 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 hi, Ron. I'm, I'm one of the students um, uh, studying sustainable development and pursuing that space. 
given that this sustainability trend has really caught on, do you think uh, being an entrepreneur is still the way to make the most impact? Uh, it's a great question in my mind. Where would you stop, start your career if you were starting in today's, uh, uh, today's context? And I think after you answer, I think uh, we have folks uh, from CNP who would like to answer this question live as well, if we can. Um, but Ron, um, please go ahead. Sure. The place where you can have the most impact is where you're the most passionate about having impact. And that means that if you feel the passion to be an entrepreneur, that's what you should pursue. If you feel the passion to be inside a large company and be at the forefront of the change that they're contributing to, that's where you should be. If you have a passion for government and public works, that's where you should go and have impact there. There is no one path that's specifically chartered to have uh, the complete impact that we need to have in this world. It requires committed people in different stations, all working within those stations to have impact. And that collective movement forward and that network that gets created is how you end up solving problems and having progress. So follow your passion in terms of whatever structure you think uh, you'll be most passionate about and most excited to work within. Um, great. Um, there, there's a, an anonymous comment, so I'll, I'll, I'll just make it. I, I think uh, somebody's at, saying, look, you know, the car lease small had tax incentives, and um, if folks uh, lease cars and don't own, it might uh, end up at a, at a, as a disadvantage. I, I think it was more of an analogy, if, if, I got, if I understand it correctly. I mean, you could say, look, renting a real estate uh, is not as good as owning because asset prices might go up, but you're really talking about not uh, necessarily renting or leasing cars versus owning cars. You're talking about when, when I'm done with the car, the car doesn't get thrown out or wasted or even recycled necessarily, but it could get uh, reused, remanufactured. Well, uh, it's that, but it also means that me as the automotive company, I don't need to spend huge marketing dollars trying to recapture you as my customer, number one. Number two is I get that asset value back that I've been getting cash flow on. And I can now give you another asset with almost no marketing costs that that cash flow from you continues. And I take that asset that you had been giving me cash flow on and I give it to another type of customer that's looking for that specific asset type. And so in that type of lease model, I'm maximizing return on capital. I built that car and lease it to you. You may only want it for three years. Fine. Pay me the appropriate cash flow for those three years. Somebody else in the market may now be looking for a car like that that's three years old. I'll transfer that asset to them, generate cash flow from them, and give you a new model and have cash flow continue to come from you. That's a very capital efficient way to generate and maximize returns as opposed to continually manufacturing for each particular customer and then not having any idea of what they've done with that asset and not being able to reutilize that asset and then having to spend marketing dollars trying to recapture that customer for a future purchase. Ron, I want to shift gears. There's, there's a, a lot of amazing, really interesting examples in the book of, of companies that are actually bringing the circular economy uh, or, or your principles to, li to life. And, and unfortunately, we only have 25 minutes to go. Um, can you choose, tell us you know, what's one or two examples that you, you like the most that really bring to life uh, your concepts? I'll give an example of um, two or three companies from an innovation standpoint. So our firm invests in everything from very early stage innovation to uh, we acquire companies for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, but for the purpose of this conversation, I'll talk about uh, some of the most innovative companies. Food waste is an energy source. Uh, there's a technology called anaerobic digestion that can take food waste or any other organic matter and turn it into gas. Uh, a number of municipalities now have large scale anaerobic digesters, either standalone for food waste or at their wastewater treatment facilities. 
there's a company in Israel called Home Biogas that has figured out how to turn an anaerobic digester into household size appliance. And so now you can take food waste that traditionally was being sent to a landfill or if it was going for beneficial use to a compost or a large anaerobic digester, it still needed to be picked up in a truck and driven there. Now with home biogas, you can put this appliance in your backyard attached to your house. You put all of your food waste into it. It converts it into gas that can pump into your um, kitchen stove for cooking. It can be used to heat your hot water. It can be used for your barbecue. So that's a company that we view as massively disruptive globally and are very excited about. It's a perfect example of using innovation to solve for uh, clean energy, health, and sanitation all in one. Uh, another company that we're very excited about is a company called uh, Mori, M-O-R-I, which uh, came out of MIT that has developed a uh, edible, odorless, tasteless uh, silk protein that is sprayed onto fruits, vegetables, and meat that creates an oxidization barrier to reduce spoilage. And using that type of technology, you can now get rid of all of the harmful plastic wrapping and packaging that goes into um, food service. Uh, so uh, that's a, uh, another example of a great innovation that we're really excited about. You also talk in your book about large companies, large established companies, uh, mega companies, uh, large caps that, that are actually on the forefront or contributing to ESG and, and what you call the circular economy. Can, can you give us examples of that or your favorite example or how, how are they engaging? Um, the best example of that is, is Unilever, who in 2010, their new CEO at the time, Paul Pullman, decided to re-engineer the focus of the business to be one on, on sustainable business practices. And he got a lot of pushback from uh, analysts and the market of, why are you focusing on this? This is going to cost money. It's only for niche uh, uh, consumers. Uh, but he stayed the course. And 10 years later, he had increased the stock price of Unilever by over 250%, which uh, far exceeded his competitors who had not focused on making their businesses more sustainable. I think what's interesting about that is the cognitive dissidence that exists in the investment world where shockingly you didn't have analysts asking every CEO in the consumer goods space, what are you, what are you gonna do to replicate what Paul Pullman's doing? Uh, you had them sort of almost not wanna pay too much attention to it because it would require them to rethink the business structures that they had been taught and had been operating under. But I think what Paul Pullman accomplished at Unilever is a, is a perfect example of a big company leading the way around circular and sustainable business practices and beating the market. You certainly talk about, thank you so much. You certainly talk about different companies, different industries, a variety of a very broad range of companies and industries where, um, where this is at play. Um, there's a question from one of the attendees. Let, let me read it. I, I think it's a great question. Uh, can you talk about some of the other industries uh, that this model would work in that we might not be thinking of? Um, something, please. Sure. Um, let's talk about the healthcare industry and COVID. Because most of the conversation today, most of the conversation around the circular economy is it can reduce costs, eliminate a lot of risk, make you more resilient. It can also save lives. And an example of that is that the way protective equipment used to be bought in hospitals was you would buy the same amount every month, use most of it, throw it away, and then the next month you would get your next shipment in. So every month you paid for new protective equipment, every month you paid to get rid of the protective equipment you used once. And that's been going on for decades. Then something like COVID hits. And all of a sudden you realize, I'm gonna need a lot more protective equipment than I've been ordering. And so you call up your supplier and your supplier says, I, I can't help you. Everybody's got more demand than they ever expected. Oh, and by the way, global supply chains have now collapsed. So I'm not gonna be able to supply you. And the result there was people died. And then 
a couple of very smart people in healthcare looked around and said, why can't we sanitize our protective equipment and just continually reuse it? Why are we throwing it away after one use? We can just sanitize it and reuse it. And so hospitals began to sanitize their protective equipment. And so that's a good example in the healthcare industry of how a circular economy can obviously cut costs because if you can continually sanitize and repurpose your protective equipment, you're gonna significantly reduce costs uh, from a um, supply side, you're buying less, and you're gonna significantly reduce your disposal costs, you're disposing of less. Importantly, you're also gonna save a lot of lives because you're gonna always make sure that uh, you have protective equipment uh, available in whatever circumstances you face. Um, you know, your, your last, um, uh, you know, actually let me take a question from, from the audience then I'll ask you another question about your last chapter in the book, uh, which I thought is very important. But this is a question from Pat, Patrick uh, Veruza, Patrick Veruza. And Patrick is asking, is first saying, thank you so much for this, Ron, um, um, and Ron Gonnett. And then um, Patrick is, is a recent uh, Columbia University graduate and an aspiring circular economy entrepreneur. Um, the question, what circular economy business innovations are you seeing catching on at the everyday consumer level? Do you see the most impact coming from consumers embracing this uh, sustainable behavior or is uh, more impact coming from companies making internal changes in how they manufacture, uh, how they handle waste and, and so on? Thanks, Patrick, for the question. Um, I see it coming from both, but um, if I'm gonna make a connection between the two or describe where the nexus is, it's gonna be in transparency. Something that we as consumers have never been able to have access to is transparency real time about the ingredients in our products and where they came from, the impact on our health, positive or negative, and who made the product that we're buying. And that technology is very quickly emerging where a consumer will be able to, with their smartphone, uh, scan a product and have full transparency about the materials used, the chemicals used, the positive or ne negative impact on their household, uh, where the materials came from and the labor used. And I think that level of transparency is where um, the nexus forms between uh, consumer interest and success of uh, brands. And that I think crosses a uh, political spectrum actually, uh, because I think almost all consumers when given the opportunity to have access to that information uh, are gonna want it. And that kind of spotlight is gonna force companies to focus on sustainability as a major differentiator or uh, premium. That, that entire area of technology and consumer access to information and transparency is a huge area and, and um, I'm going to ask you about it in, in a couple of minutes. Um, another question. Um, um, your last chapter in the book, I thought was really the right last chapter just before the conclusion, which is about scaling up, you know, scaling up uh, these solutions. And I say this because I think a lot of what we teach in business schools and what, or what we should be teaching, I think what we are teaching to a great extent in terms of management and, and the different areas in, 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 the, in the business school is about scaling up is what do you do? Okay, you start a company, um, it's a good idea, but then the issue, the challenge for an entrepreneur and a company is really to scale up, is to scale up uh, and go into larger markets. Uh, and it's a huge challenge. Um, I'm, I'm just um, elongating my answer so you can take a minute to, to risk that thrill, John, but it's a challenge scaling up for businesses. It's a challenge in a HR to keep on hiring the right people, the right DNA. It's a challenge in, in resources and in product development and design because you're having more and more segments and different uh, consumers. And so it's a challenge uh, scaling up at, uh, a stress that it puts on your brand, your brand value proposition, definition. Um, it's a challenge any, every which way you look at it, operational and so on. And so my, and that's all of what we teach in the business school is how to scale up basically. What are, what are some real, uh, frameworks for scaling up and, and managing a big business. Um, what are the challenges of scaling up the circular, you know, circular economy type solutions and how do you see it scaling up? 
I know it's an amorphic question, but uh... I, don't know. I, uh, I think that we have to get capital flowing into the space and that requires um, explaining to the financial services community why uh, this is such an attractive opportunity. And I think there's some uh, forces aligning there. I think there's been some really great exits uh, for companies focused on the circular economy and sustainability space, which has gotten the attention of uh, investors. I think what you're seeing go on now with ExxonMobil and it, the issues it's having with its shareholders and shareholder advocacy around it needing to change course is getting companies to recognize that if they just focus on the next quarter as opposed to where they need to be as a company in the future is getting more CEOs to recognize, I, I got to start building out uh, business structures and strategies that focus on circularity. Uh, I think uh, government regulators are becoming more aware of the, the cost of, of waste and that that cost is oftentimes borne on the borne by the taxpayer as opposed to the, the corporate producer. Uh, and so I think some, some new regulation coming into, into place recently is also going to help accelerate that as well. Um, one of the key points you mentioned is, is building a company, a durable company for the long term and not just focusing on the next, on the next quarter. Um, I think that's great insight for, for businesses. Um, Starbucks was, was built uh, um, this way when it had a rough patch, it was focusing on a quarter. And, and when, uh, when uh, its founder came back in, one of his major themes was focus on the long term, not just on, on the next quarter. It's something that Bill Campbell I uh, mean, rest in peace. Uh, I've learned a lot from, um, it was the chairman of the board of trustees at Columbia and a legend, legend actually at Columbia and, and Silicon Valley would always tell our students, you got to build a durable company for the long term. So I, I think it's an amazing uh, point that you mentioned. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a question from Paritosh um, um, Kulkarni. I, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Paritosh Kulkarni. And, um, the question is, are, are there, and thank you so much Paritosh for the question. Are there industries that um, cannot uh, contribute uh, to sustainability, that cannot adapt and change their, their business models and infrastructure so they can really contribute to sustainability and, and circular economy? Or, or do you think any, any industry any, um, any industry could really be a positive player here? And I, I, I think that the, uh, the extractive industries like oil and gas, mining, timber, and the landfill industries are going to be very challenged. I think they've got a major stranded assets problem that they got to figure out. Um, so they have their work cut out for them, you say. I, I'd like to um, move to a, a third um, a third topic. I know we're 10 minutes uh, from the end and I promised some Q&A, but I am taking those questions as they come. So far, all the questions, I believe I've taken them. So folks, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and please um, send us more questions for, for Ron Gunen, uh, founder and, and CEO of Closed Loop uh, Partners. Um, uh, Ron, you know, when I was reading your book, uh, as I told you, I was stopping every page, writing notes, and, and then I, I started saying, hey, well, what does it say about me as a, you know, my research is in behavioral economics, I'm, I'm a member of the marketing division at Columbia Business School. I'm a full-time business professor. And my lingo, my language is consumers. You know, when I write an article, it's about consumer behavior. And the, the folks that I write the article about are consumers. You don't call them consumers. You say they're people. Now, I agree they're people. But as I was reading your book, you, one of the um, points you make is that it is, it's about, well, should we be creating desire? Should we be creating demand or, or rather just reflecting it and, and so on and so forth? And um, there was some tension for me with behavioral economics. And then I, I started thinking, well, actually, if we want to change people's behavior, if we want to get people to uh, people and, and companies and managers, but, but also people who, who buy or rent products, what have you, Behavioral economics can do a lot, a lot for us in that uh, in that regard. Um, I guess again, I have a 
kind of broad question. What are the implications that you see? Because you know the research in behavioral economics, you've seen uh, of my research and so on. What do you think, what should we do with our, the way we research, the way we do market research, the way academia is looking at problems, um, using your, your framework of a waste-free world, of a circular economy? Any, any thoughts, any advice there? Well, I think that um, for a long time, there's been a core tenant in economics that price is the major driver of buying decisions. And that may have been true for a long time. I don't, I haven't necessarily subscribed to that. I think there's multiple uh, things that go into buying decisions. But I think that now that we're moving into a world in which there's going to be a type of transparency that's really never existed before. Behavioral economics has a phenomenal opportunity to um, transform itself um, from a discipline that's studying how, how are there uh, behaviors that can supersede uh, price to one in which how does having full transparency into a product influence buying behavior. The technology or the data set never existed for behavioral economists to actually study that. Now that data set and those technologies uh, exist. And, and that's where I see behavioral economics having huge uh, influence and, and opportunity to provide answers. Um, you, you mentioned, thank you so much. You, you mentioned um, earlier um, a really interesting point, I think, really important point about transparency and information. And even in behavioral economics, there's a, you know, the field has been established at, on, on one level on, on showing that you can change people's choices, people's behaviors, and, and um, influence these choices and behaviors and decisions and so on. And there has been some, not enough research, but some controversy. What does the digital, um, um, the digital world, you know, the convergence between internet and mobile and, and, and uh, telecom and social media and so on, what does that do to the ability of, of someone? It could be a government, it could be a company, it could be an educator, um, but what, what does it do to the ability of, to change people's behaviors and choices? And to cut to the chase, some folks say, look, um, it increases our ability to change choices because we can t do more rapid testing, A-B testing, and we can also present information in many different ways and control it. Others have said, well, the consumer or, or the individual now has much more control over the information they get. They can go to different social medias. They can, um, they're not just fed information. And in fact, the millennials are even expecting to have more transparency and more information that combined with, with this convergence um, that um, we see between channels, we see more and more omni-channel, we see more and more blurring of channels where offline brick and mortar and online digital mobile social media are combined and used together really by, by brands and by retailers and companies. And so how, how do you see that influencing or in, you know, the interplay of that with, with the circular economy? I think it's a core part of the circular economy because it is what's it, it, it's going to help consumers and, by the way, investors understand how efficient this company is uh, operating. So, is there any waste in the supply chain? Number one. Number two is, um, is this company doing something that I don't want to associate with as a consumer? And the flip side of that for an investor is this company doing anything that's going to risk a relationship with the consumer. So this type of technology and the spread of information, I think, has tremendous disruption potential for how brands design their products and how consumers buy in terms of their decision making. Like any technology, however, it can also be used for um, negative purposes. Um, you can create a lot of fear uh, by spreading misinformation about a product, for instance, that could get people thinking they had been uh, poisoned or um, were using a product that um, 
was made using labor that they don't want, but but it, it was all untrue. It was just information that spread through um, the, the, the digital airways. And so uh, like with any technology, I think the technology that's here today and about to come out holds tremendous promise, but we have to be mindful and thoughtful and strategic about how we uh, employ it uh, and deploy it. Folks, we just have a couple more minutes with, with Ron Gunan. So um, um, any questions, this is the, the time to, uh, to ask them. Um, ESG investing, Ron. Um, how, how do you see that? It's a, it's a big, uh, a, bit, a big factor these days. Um, do you see that continuing? And and I could throw in another question, so you can choose which one, which one you like. Um, and I see now we have a question uh, from from the audience. But um, um, I, I guess my question would be: where, where do you see the circular economy or sustainability five, ten years from now? Your vision. What type of world are we living in? Five years from now, 10 years from now, there is no concept of impact investing. It's just good investing and how you maximize returns. That would be success. Meaning it's ingrained. It's not a separate dimension. It's obvious. It's like it's saying, I'll invest in a company that makes money. I'm not going to invest in a company that loses money. You're saying the same thing would be with ESG. It'll just be obvious. It's it's obvious that if you want to maximize returns and reduce risk, that's the way you invest. It's not some type of niche form of investing to uh, care about the environmental record, the social record, and the governance record of a company. Um, it's 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 been a hoax that's been perpetrated that you shouldn't care about any of those uh, things. It's been a way for people to steal a lot of money from public markets and shareholders. What that type of behavior results in are things like Enron, WorldCom, Bernie Madoff, the financial crisis of 2008. If we had a system that focused on ESG as a priority, none of those events would have happened and the hundreds of billions in shareholder money that was lost would never have been lost. And we need to start to recognize that and start applying ESG as a core investment lens in order to maximize returns and significantly reduce risk. Thank you so much. I'd like to take one, one last question from the audience. And uh, um, you mentioned Bernie Madoff. That was like the evil side of the circular economy, you know, <laughs> pun intended, uh, created his own uh, circle there. Um, horrible, horrible um, um, crime. Um, that last question that we have time for, unfortunately, this is from Alexei um, um, Igomunov. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing Alexei, your last name. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, and the question is um, uh, to you on is, what are your thoughts on collaboration among circular startups? Um, does such collaboration create an advantage or a disadvantage for the industry? There's a great example of that in, in your book of, of um, but any, any, any thoughts on that? Sure, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, collaboration among circular economy innovators. And you need that because we're talking about rebuilding supply chains. There isn't one company out there, at least that we've seen, that solves for an entire supply chain. There's companies that solve for pieces of the supply chain. And so partnering together and creating that network effect is what's gonna rebuild supply chains. Thank you so much, Ron. This um, has been one of the most amazing hours that I've had at Columbia Business School, our own Ron um, Gunen with a new book, um, The Waste uh, Free World. Um, highly recommend folks uh, um, um, reading this book. Um, unbelievable career path and, and contributions, Ron. Um, wanted to thank you so much for making uh, time to speak with us today. Um, and also thanks so much to, uh, to Sandra and Diana and, and uh, the uh, Tanner Center at Columbia Business School for hosting this, um, Columbia Business School at Columbia University. Thanks uh, uh, especially also to the audience for tuning in. It was uh, lovely to host you here with Ron Gunnan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.